This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, October 3rd, 2024. Uh, we have switched to a, uh, an experiment for a couple of months where we're doing our check-in routine just once a month on the first Thursday of the month, and that's today. Uh, so everybody who is here now is familiar with the routine. I will step aside uh, and mute myself and not play traffic police for a while until everybody has checked in once. I will just step in if something is out of order or if somebody new who doesn't understand the process uh, joins us or anything like that. Um, what else? And we'll try to keep our, our check-ins relatively brief, please, so we can get to a, a conversation. But uh, what is in your mind and heart that relates uh, roughly to our world of open global mind? And uh, with that, I will mute myself and see who'd like to Jump in. Oh, and don't forget, we love pauses. So gaps in the conversation uh, in this format are extremely welcome. Thanks. So you use the chat to tell us not to use the chat. Ironic, isn't it? It worked. I'm like, wait a minute. I thought we weren't supposed to use the chat. Oh, it's him telling us not to use the chat. Also, don't everybody be silent at once. So hard. I will I will break in and continue my quick little check-in that we did pre-game show. Um and also share just some of the thoughts in my head right now. It's just, uh, it's, um, I'll, I'll do it in in in, in a threads format. So I'll start with the most positive thing I can say right now. And that is that I am thoroughly enjoying threads.net. Even though I have about 4% as many people following me, um, they haven't discovered that Mike Netson, N-E-T-S-O-N -E is the same as Mike Nelson on Twitter. Um, but it, it, it it's like Twitter was in the first two years. It's a lot of very smart techno people and people like Kara Swisher sharing the 15 things she thinks is most important. I mean, it's just really, really useful. And it's not all politics, although, of course, right now we're in politics, that we're in the silly season. Um, on the other side, um, I, I suspect some of you might comment on the vice presidential debate on Tuesday night. Um, Kathleen and I watched it all after watching the Mets win. She's a huge Mets fan. Um, and it was nice to actually hear people talking about politics, although one particular person on stage didn't bother to tell the truth. Um, and I, I'm and this is directly related to open, open global mind. I, I, somehow we have got to help people understand when somebody is completely bamboozled, trying to completely bamboozle them. And CBS had promised that they would not do on screen fact checking, but they said they were going to have 20 journalists, you know, busily typing out what the candidate said and why it wasn't quite right. I couldn't find it. I saw two or three little blurbs, real time reporting, but no, you know, comprehensive list of whoppers. And I still haven't seen the list of whoppers. And for JD Vance, it was, it wasn't, you know, twenty degrees off the truth. It was one hundred and eighty degrees off the truth. You know, oh, we didn't try to kill Obamacare. We fixed it. We saved it. I mean, what craziness! And and this is <clears throat> and he. He basically got away with it. People said he sounded so smooth. Uh, just like a used car dealer who will tell you, oh, the check engine light, that's just a, you know, that's just a, a mechanical, pro uh, that's not a, a real thing. You know? <laughs> I mean, what? Um, on the other side, let's see, the uh, other thing I mentioned before 
we turn the recording on is that I am headed to India for a Carnegie India workshop on technology policy and mostly around global or digital public infrastructure, DPI. Some people use a broader term, which is global public or digital public goods. The key piece that India has accomplished in this area is the Adhar digital identity, something I care a lot about. And there's a new report. If anybody cares about that, we have a, a call every two weeks on digital identity and why it's not working yet, or at least not working for users. There's a brand new report from ITIF that is, does a very nice job of kind of outlining what could happen if we did it right. And if, if somebody's deep into this, please join us uh, 1230 on Fridays. Let me know. Um, but they're also doing digital payments, which has Visa really upset. And they have something called the digital, uh, the data empowerment and protection architecture, which has me very excited. And again, feeds directly into the open global mind. We have to find a way to protect personal data and yet share either anonymized data or in some cases give people an effective, simple way to authorize certain users of their data to do things for the good of humanity or in return for some payment or something. But it's it, it, it's quite interesting what they're saying. It's basically vaporware now in India. It's not like the first two layers, which are actually functioning and being used by hundreds of millions of people. But the DPA um, could, could really be a prototype for data unions. Uh, I was in Taipei three weeks ago and we had a great discussion with AI Labs of Taiwan. And they're also think thinking the same way. How can we distribute data in a hundred thousand different places? You know, your hospital would have a data union or a data cooperative and other places would have the same. We wouldn't suck all the data into four or five data oceans run by Facebook uh, 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 Alibaba, and instead would have a distributed system where we could tap into the data. We wouldn't actually possess the data. We would, you know, run software against all these data sites. It's a very clean, elegant idea. Implementation is the hard part, but that's again something that's giving me optimism that we're seeing some some serious work on this and some governments providing leadership. I have talked three times longer than I normally do, but that's because I'm trying to convince myself to be optimistic after the VP debate, the attack by Iran, and the terrible things going on in Lebanon, which is somewhat personal for us here at Carnegie because we have one of our seven international centers is in downtown Beirut. So I could talk much longer, but that's enough. And um I look forward to hearing how everybody else is dealing with the surreality of life. Um, like Mike, I'm very much um, focused on the upcoming election. I think I've mentioned here before that there's a local uncensored group that I've been engaged with many times where I get really verbally attacked. Sometimes it almost feels a little threatening. And I've kind of stayed away, not because I care about the threats, but because I've already been blocked and I only got back in because I was very public and very strategic about outing them. After some digging, I found out that the group was run by an elected official. And once I was able to expose that, I mysteriously got back into the group and it was just supposedly a mistake. 
That being said, the, the rule they made was in October, we would allow political posts, but not until then. So I followed the rules like a good girl. And I only commented on other people's political posts. And I use that as an opportunity to get, you know, all the facts in, because this is probably the most uninformed group you'd ever want to meet. So when you see comedians going to the Trump rallies and you see the really dumbest people that you can't even believe are real, those are the people that you'll find in this group. Now, there's thousands of people in the group, so they're not all dumb. But the 20 loudest voices and the ones that get scary are that dumb. So that being said, when Trump went on, you know, live and started lying about Biden, that was like the first post I was able to make where I was able to show the facts about how Trump actually handled the past FEMA, you know, FEMA involved catastrophes and on a page where usually there's like eight comments, this generated close to 200 going back and forth. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is because, well, first of all, I'm thrilled that this indictment was unsealed yesterday regarding Trump's role in the election. I just haven't had time to pull out the pieces that I wanna highlight because I know I only get one shot because it's very like, oh, the, in this group that talks about the First Amendment, people have already rallied. Get this Stacey Dross out of this group. We should, they lit, one person literally said, we should ban her until after the election. This is the free speech group wanting to ban me until after the election. That being said, um, one of the, um, I don't know if he's, I, I forgot the exact title. I think he's our town supervisor, a Republican. But my intuition is he's a good person. I went to school with him. I didn't know him well, but I always had a good feeling about him. I think he tries to do the right thing. But of course, you know, right now, party politics takes over everything. But he just, so now we have this web page where we never had, we never had media in our local politics. But that's what we have now because of the times, not necessarily because of the party. And of course that gives an unfair advantage. But he just put up this morning about the different initiatives that are happening. And one that concerned me was this cryptocurrency initiative. And Mike, before the recording, I was going to ask it, I was going to ask you a little bit about it because all I put on the all I posted is where can we learn more about this initiative? Because the problem is 99, maybe 100% of us on that page don't understand it, myself included. And I bet you I'm on the top of the understanding pile and I don't understand enough. And that's the biggest problem because I think most of us will agree that it's that's when things get abused. That's when the criminals come in, when most people don't understand what's going on. And for me, my concern with cryptocurrency is how money can be laundered and things like that. And so, again, I'm waiting to see what kind of response I get, but for a local government to be having this cryptocurrency initiative, what is that about? And you know, if anybody has any idea on a basic level or can give me any questions to ask or any things to look for, I would really appreciate that. And uh, the only, only other thing I want to say on a slightly different note for the, any of you that may be sensitive energetically that don't share that, I woke up this morning and I felt this overwhelming anxiety. And right now my life is great. And I had to lay there for five minutes and remind myself that it wasn't mine. And eventually it all eased away, but so many people are feeling so anxious. So be aware of your surroundings. And if you're not feeling great and you know there's no real reason for it, just recognize that you may be picking up from other people. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, good Thursday. Is the audio? I'll pass it's the audio. Uh, Stacy, I think if you mute yours, it will be fine. Okay, how's this? All right. Well, going to get my morning chai, a nice young Asian man in a red Tesla. I was in the middle of the crosswalk and he vroom, and then swerved around me. I kept going about 40 miles an hour down a 20 mile an hour um, uh, Irving at uh, 8th and uh, nice man. Um, uh, I feel very, very good this morning. And um, I certainly on the top of my mind is um, Kevin Jones in North Carolina. And um, basically um, a number of different friends um, who are based in Asheville. And, um, you know, certainly I do nothing more than text anything I can do. Um, so here in San Francisco, we got earthquakes. Um, and uh, I'm reminded when I was in a hurricane in Southampton in 1984, waiting it out in a bar, and I was going, I miss earthquakes. And people were freaked. It goes, oh my God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we can ride out hurricanes. We're just drinking scotch and, and eating uh, um, you know, uh, fresh clams on the half shell and having a great time. And uh, people are just going, earthquakes. <laughs> um, they can't deal, which, uh, you know, if you live in California, it's like, yeah, there's an earthquake every 20 minutes somewhere. Um, just not big ones. Um, so I certainly hope that we can talk about emergency preparedness um, because hey, there's another January 6th coming up. Um, and, uh, you know, the Boy Scout motto. And I'm an Eagle Scout. Be prepared. And uh, certainly um, preparation is planning. It's thinking ahead. It's uh, reviewing many different scenarios. And uh, I think we're familiar with, with what to do. We just got to do it. Um, waiting for a call to connect with Sam about a UI. Um, and that will happen. Um, and I wish everybody a sexy day. Sexy is good. Um, so I've had a bit of a, a strange couple of weeks. I, um, I've been working on a number of projects for a number of years, and they've been slowly sort of coalescing into a single project um many of the projects are around um how do we collaborate better how do we build organizations that are that uh, allow for collaboration um and you know what are the tools that we need for that and how do we need to see ourselves in order to be able to do that and all of that kind of stuff and for a very long time those those projects all sent seemed like they were very disparate projects like they were completely disconnected kind of thing and then um over uh this last year they started to coalesce into something that that feels like a a thing and um that process has started to get to the point where i now feel like um, we're pretty close to to having a thing that's a real thing that that's actionable local um so uh, working with um, Stacy and Michael and others on um, understanding um, local currencies better because we think that might be a part of that process. Um, community currencies. Um, 
working with some other folks on uh, the uh, our protocols, uh, which is how do we do roles without doing roles, and and how do we help um, communities do how we do things better in an open source way and in a collaborative way. And uh, also working with co-ops on figuring out how do we uh, bring co-ops into an ecosystem of co-ops rather than seeing co-ops be uh, independent uh, components that that don't have a community um, structure to them. Um, some people call it platform cooperatives. Um, so some of that terminology around. So those uh, three and a couple others are are starting to sort of coalesce. Uh, we're also moving ahead on uh, the booklet that we've been writing for a while um, called uh, Serving Life and uh, trying to figure out how to, how to turn that into something that makes sense um, and, and trying to get more people involved in it. It's an open source book that may be, may be <laughs> a, uh, a neo book if we can figure out how to do a neo book, um, and uh, and genuinely open source. So, not only contributors from a from a writing perspective, but also um, the stories of people who, like all of you, I would suspect, who are learning uh, and trying to do things differently. And so, how do we put those stories into into play? as to what's emerging and, and how we're getting slowly getting somewhere. Um, so that's, that's what's happening. That's some days it feels really good and other days, not so good, but uh, that's, that's what new things brings to us. It's, it's not a straight line. And uh, Mark, I feel sexy. Thank you. Well, I'll leap in the uh, I mean, partly because I wanted to say, uh, uh, I was saying you guys want to talk about the living systems open book in a GRC session. I'd love to host something like that. So kind of just as a brainstorming, you know, engagement, I, I, I learn a lot. Be great. Um, and I, don't know, not, I didn't have too many compelling out, out uh, things to offer, but uh this weekend's uh, music, I guess, basically, we're, we're going to a, a local house concert around the corner tonight, and then hardly strictly bluegrasses this weekend, so we'll be spending a couple of days over at Golden Gate Park, and then uh, Patty Smith is at uh, the Oakland Coliseum, uh, Coliseum the old uh, Kaiser Coliseum, on Monday night, so we're going to go over and uh, for a book talk, I guess, but I think she's going to sing as well. So we're going to go over and listen to her, so it's kind of, kind of a packed-in opportunity to hear the, all these wonderful people that are or wandering around uh, the Bay Area the last, uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, and um, kind of on, I don't know, on the intellectual side, there's two two little tidbits that I thought were fun. One was, <clears throat> and I bought a copy of uh, this book, James, that people have been talking about, the, that's about, um, it's about Huck Finn. It's kind of a riff off of Huck Finn instead of, but it's uh, told from from Jim's story, the, run, the Runaway Slave. Um, and I said, well, you know, gosh, before I, before I, uh, read this, I really had to go back and read Huck Finn. Um, so it was just so cool to be able to go to Gutenberg Press and download my EPUB version of Gutenberg Press onto my Kindle and get this really clean, crisp copy of the book and, you know, be able to look up words that I didn't understand and read through this, like, really excellent book that I probably hadn't read since I was 15 or something and, yeah, uh, that it's like it's like an amazing book, and he, and you have all these ideas about like what James is going to be like. It's like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. I understand why you want to write a, a sequel to this thing. So, and uh, anyway, it was just it was a it was a little bit of a you know Stacey the tension. It's like it was a little bit of a, re a reminder of what the world could be like. You know, if uh, 
if uh, you know, if we just were able to think our way through it, I guess, or or live our way through it, because it, it just worked so beautifully. Uh, and and then the last thing that's popped up, unless something we we played with a couple of years ago, but it's kind of picking it back up again, is the idea that uh, you know we're going to have a regenerative future. One of the one of the pieces that's important is the, the movement needs a, a story. It needs people to be telling the story. Um, and there's a lot of people out there telling the story. They're not very successful or they're not as successful as they could be perhaps. So is there a way that you can create infrastructure that helps amplify the folks who are telling the regenerative story? Uh, and I'm using regenerative in a broad sense there. It means all the things that overlap with a, a world that cares about living systems. Um, and so can we create a platform, you know, a, a cooperative or something that uh, supports content creators who are telling regenerative stories and gives them maybe revenue streams and quality enhancements and um, uh, amplification, more audience, things like that. Um, and could we do that as a worker owned co-op? Um, so kind of trying to come up with that concept and see if we can start to, to pitch it to people. Uh, so anyway, those are the little threads that are being pulled on. Um, I'm not sure if you're pausing intentionally or waiting for a green light to talk. I just wanted to say, take as long as you want, but you've got the floor next if you wish. I was waiting for a green light, actually. Well, how about sure. that? My... Ready? Red, I'm... yellow, green. <laughs> it's my first time here. I don't know how it works. So, I... um, okay, um, let me see. So I'm just sort of checking in, just telling everybody what I'm doing, how I'm feeling. And uh, I've had uh, some interesting meetings with a few folks here um, on this chat and and elsewhere, uh, but in the OGM group. And um, ah, it's been great. It's been really fun. And I'm um, looking forward to more of them. Um, and uh, one thing that I liked a lot, you know, there were there were a lot of really fun threads that were appealed, but old, but one of the things that kind of got got me a little bit excited was this idea of um using uh, of of building community in a more fundamental way um is actually on a call with with Stacy and um I told her this story and I don't know I don't want to gloat over my mother's victories but um it just like feels kind of cool and it was like one of the that and it feels like this group is sort of approaching this I can't say problem but this like need I would say which is um when uh when i was a kid there was there was a big hippie community a bunch of people were kind of fell together and you know escaping the war or getting away from you know capitalism or whatever it was and they um ended up forming a really interesting community and um they had these like fairs that they would put on in the summer to raise money for people who were having trouble and problems and things and you know my dad had this spin the wheel thing and whatever but one of the things was this um all the members of the community who wanted to put up um, pictures of themselves as, as children. And, um, and so you could pay 10 bucks or whatever, you know, probably a dollar at the time or whatever it was in Canada. But, um, and um, you get to sort of write down who you thought each of them was. And so, my, and my mom won and she won this stupid little mirror, which is, you know, totally useless. It doesn't 
actually work very well, but it's like a symbol of like the community for one, but also like um, the, the, the insight or the, the care and the insight into the, um, the deeper, the deeper sense of each person that's sort of required to create a real community, to create a, a sense of community. And so, um, so I guess my thought here is like, I mean, it's, it's, you, we get a sense of that from these check-ins, like we get a sense of like who each person is and what they care about and stuff like that. But I think there's, there's also an opportunity or a potential, I'm just throwing this out there because it's sort of, I don't know, I think an interesting idea anyway, is like to talk a little bit more about our like childhoods and stuff, you know, and the things that motivate us and the things that we care about and like, you know, our successes and our victories and our, our, you know, our highs and lows, high moments and low moments and stuff. And so, so we have, uh, get a more of a sense of what, where each person is coming from, you know, when someone says, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, that's why, how, why, how would they say that? You know, um, you know, if, if we really know, you know, kind of what each person's been through on a, on a certain level, you know, it's probably a lot easier to guess where, where everything is coming from with each member. So just throwing that out there. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's, that was the format of the, the women's circle in my community when they first got together and they smoking pot and the kids were running around and whatever. And they're like, well, like, who are you? Like, where do you come from? You know, where do you really come from? Uh, don't, don't put the mask on. Tell us where you, what your problem, wh who you really are, you know? And, you know, and I, and, you know, there's a problem here. This is also in a sense, sort of a networking group. And it's, and it's, it's sort of like, you know, a lot of people who have, you know, pretty impressive masks, I would say, you know, um, and, you know, not just masks, but lives, you know, and so there's a kind of probably some desire to, 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 um, you know, show each other our best, put our best foot forward, so to speak. But I don't know, just the thought that if we really want to build like an authentic connection with each other, then we probably have to do a little bit of the mask removing, which is scary. But anyway, uh, so aside from that, that's, and, and me saying that doesn't say anything about me checking in, but, um, gosh, uh, well, yep. I'm, uh, I've had some fun meetings with people. I just got off the call with Kaminsky, which was fun, right? Wonderful chap. And, um, I'm, I'm trying to open a practice here in Amsterdam and I'm dragging my feet cause I really want to be working on the software, which I'll admit to myself. Um, but I need to, I need to increase my income at this moment. So I'm, uh, I'm opening, reopening my practice and I need to be practicing. Like I need to be, I kind of can't go too long without seeing patients. And that's like, before you start to, you know, I don't know, forget too much stuff or whatever. So, so it's, I'm, I'm jumping back into that and, and, um, dragging my feet a little bit, but taking some steps today. And, um, what else can I say? Yeah, I'm just happy kids are running around and babysitters here. So that's always good. And we have, yeah, I'm meeting with the parent teacher association, blah, blah, blah. But, um, and uh, interesting ideas about using 4B to get influencers to pull their, their audiences <laughs> for what products to sell them, which it sounds horrible to me, but this is Kaminsky's kind of ideas. Like you need to work with people who are connected and who can, who can, um, virally, you know, <clears throat> super spreaders, like, 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 um, very same. And, and it would kind of stumbled upon this idea of like having, you know, the, uh, whatever, uh, Kardashians of the world sort of get their, get their users to tell them what products they want to, you know, label, for their you know limited edition hand totes or whatever so i don't know whatever that's the idea that's all i have to say i guess peace out
David, welcome. I don't think you've ever been on a check-in call, have you? No, I just heard that it's a rare beast once a month. So uh, I got some things I could talk about, but I'm also here to listen to see what, what's the, what the current state is, because I'm kind of emerging out of hibernation. So Nice, nice. Uh, welcome. Uh, shake off the fur and, and settle in. Um, and feel free to step in and, uh, you know, share where you are. That'd be great. It's very nice to see you again. Uh, and I'm not playing, uh, I don't direct traffic during check-in. I, uh, I mute myself until I've checked in, until every, everyone's checked in only once. Uh, and then we switch into regular conversational mode. So whatever you'd like. Uh, so, um, like I said, I've, I've been a long time in kind of hibernation. I've been for, on a quest for a few years now to create a, a small, tight little team that works on making stuff uh, in OGM space. You've been through maybe four or five iterations of such a team, I would say. Um, rather than just open conversations and coming together, I really want to like uh, um, uh, build and. The, the way that's kind of emerging to feel that I can start to sort of like um, look for um, conversation and, and open um, invitations to, to sort of say, hey, what do people think of this is because um, um, uh, um, the, the current project that um, I'm, I'm uh, working with in partnership with others is uh, basically this kind of 12 month uh, academy, a research institute based around um, some IP that we wish to put into the common ownership. So uh, it's a common centered project based around um, the work of Douglas Adams, so Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So we have that IP because uh, my partner worked with Douglas, I knew Douglas as well, um, uh, back in the day in London in the 90s. And um, the um, project that we're focusing on is to, I mean, I got kind of stupidly obsessed with the number 42, as you do, right? So uh, basically the answer to life, the universe and everything is, um, is basically uh, citizen assemblies or micro assemblies and the smallest statistical assembly you can uh, create is around about 40 people 40 to 50 people right so pose any question you want and the answer is kind of a citizen assembly so um and then the question is how do we network those what uh, uh architecture of this group to group um, conversations in person, local, face-to-face, um, -face, intentional communities conversations. What's the the architecture of networking those uh, conversations? So we're looking to fund 42 research fellows for 12 months, um, giving each of them a budget of 42k. So that's a total budget of about two million. Um, and they do their own journeys. They're hitchhikers, and we're phrasing hitchhikers as basically interdisciplinary nomads uh, it can be people from various diaspora communities it can be so we're particularly working with in the european context ukrainian belarusian uh, these sorts of diaspora who have a um, a need to work to each other but also um, nomads intellectually and spiritually who are basically bridging gaps between different communities people who are kind of dark talent who are difficult to fit into a company structure or a, a academic structure. Um, so I'm sure that's all of us here. Um, maybe I, I'm speaking for some right? Um, give them a budget, they manage their own budget. And then they, one easy thing is just do your own thing. And we curate a, a cohort of 42 people somehow we can talk about somehow there um, first year we're, we're giving ourselves a bit of artistic license so the theme of the first year is douglas's last work which was hitchhiker's guide to the future um, and we're basically looking at the poly crisis and trying to figure out what forms of governance or collective intelligence can govern the dangers uh, with regard to the future so um um, sorry.
Oh. Yes, you're still here. I thought I clicked on the wrong button there. Um, so um, uh, the, the easy bit is that the hard bit is how to get all these 42 mavericks, individual, slightly crazy people to work on something together. So that will be a requirement that they basically have to do. They have to create, put on stage at the end of the year, a, a joint work. It's like a, a group show, if you like, and publish it, right? Um, uh, it's all going to be published into the Commons on this Commons that we're calling an archive. So we've um, got a few technical partners on that, but some of the fellowship will be about creating that 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 um, uh, an archive, right? Technically, uh, how we do it, so that the the citizen assembly like conversations are preserved sustainably preserved there is no archive for all those conversations and that's things like the documentary interviews the audio interviews the the deliberations the summaries of those conversations finding a place for that and i know obviously we're talking here about like um um the open global mind the network how the metadata is arranged also the licensing around that commons um, um, how the costs of archiving it are, are, are done. So some common space sustainable economy around that. Um, and then we're looking at guides as this form of, I know Jerry from talking to Pete Kaminsky, um, there is a, an initiative around a new form of future of a book type concept uh, here. So for us, that's what the guides are. And so we have the idea is to publish a series of guides, which is some sort of digital book. Um, and that would be part of that platform. And um, uh, um, then we're playing with this sense of humor, uh, which is we consider ess the essence of one of the pillars of any form of governance is that there is a jester in the room. There is that kind of creative hacker jester spirit in the governance. Um, and we're using science fiction as a methodology. So the aim is to um, um, run these citizen assemblies with com communities where in an embodied way, you picture the future um, scenarios that um, are in, and then you backcast to the present layer, the kind of documentary layer of um, seeds of that future. And then you have to um, plan a series of steps between the, the present and that envisaged future. And that methodology for writing is, is based on something called hard science fiction, where it's a science fiction, but in the dictionary part, you have to base it on real code, real law, real um, uh, uh, um, anthropology, real um, sociology, so, uh, so, so forth. Um, and um, we have our first Congress is a kind of flag um, that we're putting in the the, the soil um, in um, Cyprus. We have a Congress in December two to six. Um, it's being supported by um, various of the kind of innovation, um, culture ministry people in Cyprus. Um, and we aim to um uh it's it's a, a a small event it was going to be a bit bigger but now we're basically looking to get maybe about 20 speakers out there to kind of live together for a week and we're organizing the the debate through a, a series of um um embassies so embassies are these physical places where you can have citizen assemblies and we're hoping somewhere between um, six and maybe 12 initial embassies with the aim of creating 42 embassies that cover the geographical cultural background. Some of them small, some of them rural, some of them urban, some of them in universities, some of them in theatres. But basically the end show will be to put this kind of science fiction story on stage um, to structure it with real law, uh, a real commons and real code so it's a, a working prototype of that science fiction future um, and to um, publish that in a year's time um, and to fund this 12 month fellowship, uh, probably starting with just six fellows, um, it looks like. So we're at that stage now where I, I feel 
confident enough about it to talk about the people we're working with and to invite um, people of good intent who find it an interesting story and might like to be a research fellow themselves or might have an idea of a venue where we could have an embassy um, in, in this location um, or this other location or would like to work on a particular piece of software or um, would like to write a science fiction script you know it's like um, or have some thoughts on how we should structure it um, that's um, where I'm at right now And can I have a show of hands who's a Hitchhikers fan? Wow. <laughs> Everyone apart from Stacy, you're not a fan, are you? <laughs> Seems to be a guy thing. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, there's a couple things that you just uh, trigger. We have um, in the DC area, actually, we had a, a conference there, but there's an open gov hub group. It's um, kind of like a, a we work place, but it's actually they've got a board. You have to be a, a, a um, nonprofit doing work for the public good to become a member and stuff. But they have the one here in Washington, DC, and I think they have several around the world too. That, um, and then there was dc.gov is that right sorry what open dc.gov open dash dc.gov open, open gov hub okay and uh then uh, there was a software coming out of germany it was called wonder.me i don't know if you ever looked at that uh, jerry because you're always in that space too it's it's gone now, but they actually had um, room. The, the room size could be anywhere from two to fourteen. They had. There was supposed to be some research that said the max group size should be fourteen or mm -hmm. whatever. But I ha I've been doing research. I haven't been able to find that. But of course, fourteen times three is forty-two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're basically um, my sacred geometry, which I've been obsessed with, is basically seven times six mm -hmm. so it's like you start with a group of six which is about the maximum conversational size five or six people say and then each one of those is responsible sociocracy style for convening another group of six and then you have seven groups of six and that's your kind of primitive cell is we're, kind of what i'm going with we're trying to avoid conversation until everybody's checked in once oh, but what you're saying is super interesting uh if you can hold it off until we're done checking in please okay yeah and i guess um just for Check in. I'm actually. Um, I have to leave at the top of the hour. We have. Uh, um, I work for the federal government. We have a uh, 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 AI series. Um, there's a technical track that's today, and there's also a, a um, leadership and policy um, track. The one for um, the technology track is actually um, been. Um, uh, Peter, um, I don't like on his name, Google Research. He's with San, he's now with Stan, like Stanford Human Centered AI group. Oh, Peter Norvig. Yeah. Um, he's, he's the lecturer there. And then there's a group at Princeton that's doing the, doing the, um, the um, leadership and policy on, on AI. So that's the big thing for me right now. I'm looking to get back to uh, PhD starting in January. So. Rick, um, I think it's just you and I who have not checked in yet. Uh, Stacy, you checked in, right? Yes. Um, and so I, I don't know if you have to bolt quickly, but if you wanted to go first, I'll go last. That worked out fine as well. Thank you, Jerry. Um, 
I am absolutely intrigued by the number 42 as described by you, David. The way you were talking was just fascinating for me. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be brief because I'm at work and juggling balls and whatever, but I just wanted to pop in. Um, <clears throat> and I, I've tried this a couple of times before, but it's like anything, you have to fail many times before you succeed. And one of the things that I've been working on for some time is using Suno to create songs. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to just preface this with a brief story. Uh, and this, this happens to many artists. Um, but I, I was listening to The Voice and Gwen Stefani was talking about her struggles as an artist from the age of 19. It took her a decade before she made, uh, you know, the big scene. And think about writing songs, whatever. You never know what's going to catch on. Uh, there's a documentary called uh, Songs Explored. And there's an amazing story about um, losing my religion. And the story behind that is just unbelievable. The stories behind uh, major hits and how many people have to fail before it anything catches attention. So um, I, I, um, I watched the, um, the, the VP debate and I thought, I'm going to write a story about it based upon that. And then I did and I published it. Um, and then afterwards I thought, Don the traitor, Don the traitor of the divided states of America. So I took that idea, did some research using AI, collected a bunch of stuff that's that's come out of um, uh, Jack Smith's recent um, publications. Um, and I thought, wow, there's so much stuff here. It's just unbelievable. And I was so disappointed both by Harris and uh, Wallace in terms of being confrontational. We need radical candor and we need to use um, dis, um, uh, paradoxical interventions very strategically in order to destabilize the rigid dysfunctional polarization, which means that you're going to make some people more extreme on the one hand. On the other hand, you're going to, you're going to cause some defections. And that's a risk that's well worth taking. So as you were uh, chatting, I, I just put the finishing touches to a LinkedIn article, which I'll share. And if people are interested, uh, they can go and comment and listen to the song. And I've done, I think, nine different versions of the song so you can choose your music genre of choice and if you don't like music just read the lyrics as a poem um and i'll put the link in and at some point i'm going to have to pop out but i can't say when because i'm at work so um i don't know whether this is on par to becoming a a, a digital hit or not but i'm going to plug this one because it does something that from my point of view both the debates fail to do which was to land a knockout punch on Don the Con. So that's my chicken. Uh, Rick, you have special dispensation to post that link to the chat before we've all wrapped up uh, the check-in. So um, please do. Uh, and I will I will check in so that we're all uh, all in. Um, it's it's um Early in this call, I created a, a thought in my brain for all the turmoil that's out there from, you know, Iran sending missiles to Israel, broadening that conflict to the disaster in Western North Carolina, to the election kerfluffle, to everything else. There's just a lot going on and it's hard to stay centered and focused in the middle of all those things. Um, um, and one thing just from me looking out that I'm happy about is that um, I've been able to um, start finding a rhythm for posting stuff. Uh, and I've got a sub stack up and a few other things that I'm I'm actually writing an article about how I'm cross posting. Uh, the, the original article goes on Pete's massive wiki and then I cross post to Substack and usually LinkedIn and usually Medium and stuff like that and how that all works. And uh, I wrote a couple of, you know, I have a speaker's reel out and I wrote a couple of behind the reel <clears throat> posts that were really, really fun to do because there's a lot of moments in this four minute reel that mean a lot to me and that have a lot of background. So I'm telling the backstory and that's working pretty well. But just doing that little bit of digging in one little spot in the garden kind of 
uh, points out to me how massive this problem is and how many things we all need to create and put in the commons in some way that doesn't destroy the commons, but rather makes it more findable. And David, your project sounds great. Uh, I'm, I'm eager to hear more about it when, when I'm done checking in and we switch into conversational mode. Um, you are, you're always up to interesting sort of artful civic uh, projects and I, uh, I'm very glad you, you surfaced. Um, so there's plenty more I want to say, and I also have a whole collection of, of links to add in to things that other people have said during the call, but that's only appropriate if I stop my check-in now and uh, switch us over into conversation mode. So let me do that. Um, so with that, we are all checked in. Feel free to go crazy on the chat. And I'm going to, first thing I'm going to post on the chat is uh, my wishful thinking about what I wish uh, Waltz had said during the debate. And I know that... Uh, uh, Hindsight is 2020, but uh, hey, here we go. And uh, it turns out that my post is too long for one post in the uh, chat. So uh, it's a, a thousand eight characters and it's only a thousand uh, is the limit. So there's the full post in two chunks. Uh, otherwise, let's go to Mike and Mark and everybody else feel free to post whatever you want in the chat. I'm going to try to be very brief, but I was inspired by many things that were said. Um, let me start with a very strong second to the idea of spending more time talking about where our childhood took us. Um, a lot of studies indicate that the music that people find most emotive and most transformative is usually the music they heard from the age of about 12 to 15. And I know for me, a number of books that I read in the eighth and ninth grade have shaped me forever. Um, some by Kurt Vonnegut, Candide by Voltaire. And I, I heard Jerry refer to Digging in the Garden and I thought, ooh, he must have read Voltaire too. <laughs> um, other things, a little, just to pick up on what David outlined is, I'm just incredibly excited about what you're doing, partly because I spent a year in Cyprus my oh. wife was the ambassador from the U.S. to Cyprus for three and a half years. Um, <clears throat> I was working for Cloudflare at the time, and I got to know all the tech community of Cyprus, or at least all the really cool people who were extroverted and talking about what they were doing. I, I didn't get in too close with the Ukrainian oligarchs who were building some of the biggest, most successful war games, online, online war games in the world. But you should see if you can get them to sponsor this. <laughs> Um, and we'll be in touch because I, I do have some some ideas on this. Um, and I love the idea of uh, 42 times 42. Um, I also wanted to pick up on something Mark said about emergency preparedness. And I think that could be one of the drivers for some very effective OGM projects. And I think, Jerry, you know Lynn Wells. He's been working at George Mason University. He was at the Department of Defense for many years. How do you spell at, his first name? L-I or L-Y? L-I-N-T-O-N. -N. So it's Linton Wells. Um, really interesting projects in his re semi-retirement, but he's working in Puerto Rico. He's got a lot of this grassroots effort to build resilient societies and uh, he, and he's doing it. You know, he's getting real money, and some of it comes from DoD, some of it comes from academic grants. But I think he'd be an amazing guy to just share his insights. Do I have with... the right guy here, Linton Wells the second? Yes. Cool. And um, yeah, I, I think that would be fun. I I came to Washington for one year in 1988, and my first assignment was emergency preparedness, particularly for earthquakes, because my PhD was in seismology, plate tectonics. And um, uh, Al Gore was really interested in this, and he was the chairman of the committee that I worked on. So um, we, we, we haven't done nearly enough in the 35 years since I started exploring all that. Um, and just to pick up on another thing Mark said, and we do need to prepare for another January 6th, and I urge you all to go see a documentary called War Game, mm. streaming now. I saw it here at George Mason University, and it was really, really fascinating. It's a, you know, they got together about 20 current or former uh, political types, 
and ran through a scenario that was basically January 6th plus a bunch of National Guard people who were supposed to help control the mess flipping over to the other side and uh, what, you know, what do you need to do? And so they had the head of the National Guard in Maryland. They had um, Governor uh, Bullock of uh, Montana who ran for office, ran for the presidency on the Democratic side. He was playing the president. I mean, it was, it was really, really well done. And this was all spontaneous. This was, you know, new things coming in from the scenario and reacting in real time and, and very, very captivating. And so I think that's, for now, um, that's uh, what I wanted to say, except that I also wanted to tell people who want to read James um, that Diane Rehm, the uh, national public radio celebrity, uh, has a book club now. She's semi-retired. And on September 25th, she had a meeting of her book club devoted to that book. So if you don't have time to read the book, spend an hour and listen to Diane Reem and a bunch of people who did read the book. Love that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, very much. Uh, Mark. I can pass for a check-in from Judith, and I can basically come back after she checks in. If Judy, um, like Judy maybe just listening in. Judy, do you want to uh, check in at all? I think Judy is at the periphery of our conversation right now, so it's uh, fine to go ahead. Sorry, I just unmuted, and I need to uncamera things. So. <laughs> oh, good. Me? Um, sorry, I just got back from my other meeting. Um, in terms of the check-in, what I'm working on right now, I'd love to make the subject of some deeper discussion. Um, I'm trying to execute in Minnesota a program analysis, analogous to what is called CPRIT, C-P-R-I-T, Cancer Presentation and Research Institute of Texas, which is a $100 billion funded at the state level by state approved net total statewide election of the actual municipal bond. And the goal is to attract high talent faculty to the universities in Texas. And then it's available to various institutions to offer an additional million dollar grant money to a faculty applicant to try to entice them to come to a Texas university rather than to go to some other state. It's a really effective program in Texas. And when I talked about it with the department head here, she said, oh yeah, we've lost some really good candidates to Texas because they could give them that extra million dollars. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to, I've never done work with the legislature. So this is a new venture for me. And a friend of mine who's an attorney, who's a former legislator suggested that I work with a fellow he knows who's a regent at the university to get the regent to support the application to the legislature and so forth. But I'm in the very early days of this. So anyone who's pitched or sold these types of proposals, I'd be interested in guidance on how to pursue that. Um, I think it's a really worthy initiative. Minnesota has a very strong medical device community that is already participatory. We do not have any pharmaceuticals. So that's a disadvantage in terms of the scope but we also have Mayo in addition to the universities. Um, so I think it's a viable proposal, but I'm new to this arena. <laughs> so that's kind of my check-in for now. It's early stages. I've got lots of information. It's the 20th anniversary of Secret in Texas, and they've done a sort of retrospective review. I mean, they're up to tons and tons of money that have been appropriated over multiple years uh, by state legislature funding of a general vote of the state. And it's all about making sure the people in the state of Texas stay healthy, basically, is the pitch they're using to the general public. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. And uh, Mark, thank you for making room for Judy. That was perfect. It is now your turn.
Okay, going backwards. Judy, I'm a cancer survivor. Um, I've written tons of proposals in my life. And um, basically, I am considering running for um, regent of the University of California. So oh, I don't have big goals. Um, but uh, basically, the medical system does not work. It right. does not. And um, from the inside and from below, one makes oneself low in order to be high, says the Tao. I've been at the bottom. So let's talk. Um, going backwards, David, I've worked with Howard Rheingold to basically create a pattern language for online community. I have software. Um, I know exactly what needs to be done um, for your proposal, but I'm always open for looking at things differently and looking for change. 42 divided by um, three is 14. Um, we start with groups of three. We don't start with groups of um, seven or, or, or 42 or, or whatnot. Um, basically three is the smallest um, stable cell, um, uh, the triangle, basically what um, uh, uh, RB, uh, our Buckminster Fuller um, looked at as the smallest stable system um, is a triangle. Um, uh, basically, you have groups of three and more, um, but uh, you also start with groups of two. Um, the software I have is MX. I've been working on it since 1992, and basically I got fired from the Internet Archive, where I worked at the bottom um, debugging. So I can accept input through a fire hose um, and basically know how to organize it into um, something that's accessible to people um, and create a UI for it. So um, we need to talk. Mike, um, I'm friends with Kalia, identity woman. Um, I'm not sure if she's part of your identity group, um, but she needs to be. Um, certainly um, uh, a member of our group here, um, David Kelly, um, scenario guy. Um, he's also somebody who works with- John Kelly. John Kelly, I'm sorry. Thank you, John Kelly. Um, and so um, I'm hoping to talk with Sam about a UI for his- uh, uh, governance proposal. I think the governance proposal he had is silly, and um, I'm not afraid to say so. Um, and uh, but hey, let's um, play every card in the deck. Let's play um, the uh, emotional healing from having cancer. Um, UCSF has a uh, absolutely incredible um, psycho oncology group that basically um, works with people post cancer to make sure they keep on a healing path. Um, Judy, I'd love to connect you with these people because they know exactly what they're doing. Um, although, you know, the system is broken. Um, you know, it's impossible to find a um, psychiatric or um, psychological help without going into a crazy making system of trying to find the right um, uh, help. I mean, the Osher Center for Integrative Mex Medicine is for rich people. I can't afford it. Um, and, you know, it's just impossible to get into things like mindful meditation. Um, you know, they do have public programs that are for free, but if you basically want to be part of the um, healing group, it's for rich people. You can't afford it. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, they do great work, but uh, hello, let's take a look at the audience that needs help. Um, certainly, um, you know, they have their funding priorities, they have their research priorities, and they have their um, you know, monetary goals that don't include people who have no money. So, um, David, I'm going to follow up with you. Mike, I'm going to follow up with you. Judith, I'm going to follow up with you. And Sam, um, I've offered to follow up, and he's, you know, we're playing phone tag or, or not. So, um, and Jerry, we got to have a chin wag again. Um, we had one back in ninety. Four or 92 or something like that. Um, but basically, I am restarting my work on MX, um, a free um, open source way of basically managing your own lifetime digital archive um, with all kinds of different um, uh, digital artifacts um, that one basically interacts with from, I don't know, um, high school to as long as you live. So um, Mark is the only person I've met who has been curating a database for longer than I have. 
um, basically 200 and, or two, 2.5 million plus um, uh, digital um, items that are unique and about 15 million links between them. So I've been doing this since um, 1984. And um, David, I have a um, secret tribe that I've known since 1981. Um, we work together on things. Um, David, um, this tribe is going to be at Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. We're going to have four different um, uh, blankets in front of, you know, one in front of each stage. And we know each other, so we can basically hop very quickly. Ooh, that's them. smart. Good strategy. And um, I'm offering my home at 1436 8th Avenue. Um, you can send a missile there if you like. Um, <laughs> but um, basically, um, as uh, it's walking distance, 20 minutes, um, there's going to be handicapped people. Um, and so basically, it's a hub for people who want to drop off stuff, park in the same place, um, walk down together, um, come back, get their stuff. Um, I'm looking for somebody to volunteer every day as a conciergerie um, who stays at my house and takes stuff in and lets people in the gate and um, knows who can you know drop off stuff and who can pick up stuff up, um, you know, a hub for bicycles. Um, and I've been doing this for 20 years um, for Hardly Strictly. So we know that's the best organized, secure, free concert on the planet. Um, and if anybody wants to go to search HSB, um, or hardly strictly bluegrass. Um, not only Patty Smith, but um, uh, Cat Power. Uh, um, I, I, the the lineup is world class, and it's free, and it's been uh, uh, put together by people who know how to do large events. And if you anybody's gone, you just know that it's secure. And it's well run. They have uh, carts for handicapped people. Um, you know, there's many, many old people who go. Um, it's safe. It's a little crazy because there's tons of different artists and you know, multiple tens of thousands of people who attend. Um, David, let's talk seriously um, because. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you're doing. I've done it and failed over and over and over again. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, David. You're muted, however. Um, Our ability to hear you will be vastly improved when you unmute. Yeah, a big part, actually, of the, um, um, the decentralized gathering conversation across spaces is, is translation and being able to have the conversations in your own language. Um, um, it's not live communication. Um, it's more like message in a bottle type stuff. Um, send it out there, it gets reworked, comes back. Um, just responding to some of the sort of like uh, input um, and things. One of the things that's really dear to my heart as the result of this 12 month uh, academy in terms of creating um, uh, this um, um, future state infrastructure, which is a basically um, it's to be used by practical communities on the ground. So. Um, we're particularly, I lived in Belarus for a while just before the revolution. I was working with the programmers there. We were all thrown out. A lot of them went to Ukraine. I host a Ukrainian um, uh, uh, artist here um, uh, and hang out with that community very much. Um, and um, the idea that has just plagued me for so long, or the, the thing is like from before the Arab Spring and then the Arab Spring, um, everything from Occupy going onwards is there are these moments of um, um, impassioned kind of potential for revolutionary change um, that then because of the lack of structure that you can roll out sufficiently quickly, um, get basically corrupted by some form of 
gangsterism of one sort or another. So what we really need is this emergency digital state infrastructure for failed states, mm -hmm. for if Lukashenko falls in uh, Belarus or um, um, even at a smaller level uh, when when reconstruction money goes to rebuild a, a bombed out city, whether it be in Gaza, whether it be in, in Ukraine, a way of popping up this um, democratically, authentically provable, mandated set of opinions with expertise, with transparent accounting. It's kind of, you know, financial, legal, democratic infrastructure, which should be should be developed and maintained by some international body, whether that be United Nations stroke, some independent foundation or what have you, that is basically providing that for any um, community or city um, and that, that's plastic enough for them to craft and, and, and um, uh, their own values um, and their own particular form of governance on top of, but um, originally offers that kind of protection. And um, in particular, we're working with the um, there's quite strong set of shadow institutions for the Belarusian di diaspora, the opposition there. And um, in terms of identity, identity woman, you mentioned, you know, Kalia and what have you, um, offering, making sure that the whole entity, so we have to transfer the IP for hitchhikers into the commons, everyone who attends an event, everyone who's a speaker, uh, it will be a mutual owner of the project and the IP and they will use we want to get I think identity is a the most important pillar uh, of such a community um, and um, the ability to have um, privacy respecting voting um, so for instance w one of the partner organizations that um, we haven't formally done anything in terms of uh, a structure, but they run um, three interesting elections in Russia, in Belarus and Iran using zero knowledge proof where you scan in the biometrics from your passport, then throw it away and how you can provably vote uh, without being at risk of being um, 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 nabbed by the, the secret police. Um, that kind of infrastructure is really needed by some that privacy respecting. So rather than it just being a political or theoretical thing, we want to work with projects which are demanding that kind of infrastructure. So the diaspora across Europe, they need it for their business startups to be able to trade, to cooperate. They don't have diplomatic representation. Um, so have uh, creating that with people like Khan Ross, the independent diplomat, that kind of service, but doing it digitally. Um, um, and that's also why Cyprus is also involved and interested because of this political situation in Cyprus. Um, it's, it's really interesting when you explore um, how you can uh, reconcile, you know, land disputes uh, uh, between the north and the south over places like um, Famagusta, um, the ghost town, the famous ghost town there, um, where um, it's just been unused. It was the number one tourist destination in Cyprus for ages. Um, and um, uh, so put really like playfully, creatively, but with the proper budget, being able to create a digital network state infrastructure based on the demands of real community use, but then offering that into the commons such that hopefully it can be scaled and picked up as a, an emergency state digital infrastructure. That's really, um, for me, like uh, the end ambition of that. Um, so getting that legal governance structure right, which I know there are several parallel groups that's um, 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 but giving people an, an experimental play space where every year we can propose a new science fiction. The second thing I pick up on that some people said was um, the use of generative AI. Um, so in the science fiction infrastructure, um, the ability and the ability to do these workshops with um, citizen assemblies, these kind of theatrical workshops, you want these co-writing groups to be able to imagine scenarios. So the kind of augmented script writing help where you get that feedback, you get that feedback in terms of writing. Um, it's 
in our case, we're working within the model of legislative theater where you embody and enact various scenarios, but the end result you want to publish is a set of laws or a set of human centered agreements which help structure um, that um, tension or that chaos uh, that you then basically can build, test out and iterate through. So that human centered agile process of designing the governance for real communities so we have one project, um, it's a project, independent project. Um, they're actually thinking of naming the city. It's a regenerative city um, that they want to call 42, which is hilarious as an idea. But it's uh, basically in uh, Bucha, in, outside Kiev, in, 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 in that area. And the, the land is owned partly by in private hands. There's two plots of private land ownership, and then there's a large area of municipal land. And they have a set of agreements in place to build a, a significant regenerative city. Um, and uh, they're getting the support of uh, Harvard and MIT working on that. So that institutional um, uh, link is, is, is there as well. So um, um, uh, finding the right kind of research fellows who would work on that kind of uh, concrete project for that kind of diaspora and them being in different domains and getting that governance structure for the, the group itself. So how they get paid, how they vote, how they select the 42, how they pass that on to a, a new um, fellowship the next year, that passing on of power, that kind of thing. It, it's really the, the topic of their research is to create that governance structure for the governance and they have to picture it in the future. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Future of a City, uh, how you live, what the laws are like, what the economies are like, what retirement is like. It's up to the fellows themselves. And one of our starting points is um, uh, we met with uh, Audrey Tang when she came through Europe um, and her book, uh, um, together with Glenville uh, Plurality, is to take that as well as one of the things we put on the Commons as uh, a, a GovTech framework um, that you can also start to fork and you can start to deliberate and you can start to create a kind of science fiction script out of um, that you then picture and then you backcast and that storytelling process. So um, the aim is really to try and find, you know, the best people we can, make it fun, make it playful. Um, uh, ideally, we get a proper film budget for this or a proper game budget, you know, $15 million for a, a kind of indie uh, film, science fiction film, um, or uh, the equivalent for a, a game. And um, even if we don't succeed in raising that finance, which I'm quite hopeful about, if, I mean, it all comes down to the quality of the script in the end. Um, uh, then the running of the workshops, the, 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 the focus groups, the structure that we get up and build, that, that'll be a, a useful open source commons in itself. Um, David, thank you very, very much. I just want to call pause for a second. Uh, Kevin Jones has joined us and he, his, his home was taken away by the Sawananoa River recently in Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm thrilled you're here and just want to hear what's up for you. Thank you. It was not easy to get here. Um, what do you say? You know, my, the river did go through our house for six hours. And so um, one thing that's done is that, you know, we can insurance will build it back, but it is no longer ever going to be a, a significant liquid asset because it's river has flown through it. So we have a our decision to make it a retreat and Airbnb center is there. We're living in an Airbnb that didn't get water and went to the next to top step next to my daughter's little uh, kind of uh, DIY hippie semi-anarchist village. <clears throat> We're, we've discovered, you know, things aren't working. Okay. So <clears throat> to flush, we are getting water from the creek. Uh, to uh, get drinking water, there is a neighbor who has a solar uh, generator with a well that's uh, filtered, but we're boiling it. So we solved that. We no longer have to do bottled water. We have propane. We went, uh, we, we drove uh, up to Johnson City and spent two days getting like, you know, showers and they had lights that turned on and all that kind of thing. It was really kind of amazing. You could pay with a what's called a credit card. Heard of <laughs> and, um, and so we brought back a generator. And so if we keep that um, 
on uh, and not really use it, we can use the generator five hours a day. And we figured out a less noisy place to put the generator. But, you know, in about seven hours and we're uh, the Teslas have been amazing because they can charge all these big flashlights and lamps and also iPads, phones and everything else. And everybody ran out of gas over the weekend, but we didn't. Uh, I'm, I just went to get my car charged for the first time since, uh, I don't know, Tuesday. And uh, but whereas Rosalie's car is, yes, the Tesla has been you know, the, the workhorse. It's bigger and has a bigger battery. Uh, I'm really involved in looking at uh, resilient infrastructure that works when this kind of thing happens repeatedly. I've got a fundraiser I sent to the list. We're trying to get a, a microgrid hub that would be electricity at a community center. Uh, Starlink is the only reliable internet. I, I, they're around here, but the map was wrong. But I, but uh, T-Mobile got me online. I'm you know within 30 yards from them and. Uh, so charging becomes a huge thing. Uh, you know, everybody else, water is incredibly critical. Uh, it, what's been amazing is how well the government has been integrating their efforts from FEMA to the county to uh, the Department of Transportation. The, the city is a shit show, but they always have been. Uh, you know, they've had four DEI uh, leaders in three years. I mean, so, you know, we have our, our community equity fund that does uh, friends and family funding. We work with the county. We just don't want to work with the city. And so they're being, you know, expectedly dysfunctional, uh, but better than normal. But uh, the FEMA app is incredibly easy. And I had a friend who got on FEMA with a phone and only took 20 minutes uh, you know, the National Guard was in town on Saturday. They came to our farm on Sunday. Wow. Uh, I haven't really gone and looked at the rest of the property. I just, it's just too sad. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, something came up. I was listening to 1A and they were interviewing our local really good uh, Blue Ridge Public Radio reporters. What are you doing about wellness? And it's like, we're working 12 hour days and don't really have time. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that question. But, you know, we are, we are, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, they've, they've gone to the affordable housing places and had uh, EMTs carry bottled water. And then now they're doing water distribution at the affordable housing places now. Uh, and then uh, the other things, uh, you know, the, the FEMA is at the major distribution places to help people fill out uh, the, the forms to get. And people are getting, you know, my son managed our Airbnb and the glamping that's all gone. <clears throat> and he can get cash for um, lost uh, income. I mean, they're, they're, they're quick and easy to help us out. And I've never seen the government work this well together. It's, it's, uh, it's, I'm not a big government fan, but God damn, this is working well, you know, uh, and they're, they're listening really well. And they're, they're, you know, we're up to, I think, 64 deaths in our county, uh, but they're still looking for folks. And the registrar of deeds, a really clever guy, has put all the places uh, online and he's got a team of 800 volunteers going to knock on doors to see if people in this house uh, have been reached. And so, you know, then the, in Swan, we're in Swan and Oa, and I've sent this thing out. <clears throat> um, so there are a council of mayors that meets every week, and that's Black Mountain, Woodfin, Weaverville, and Asheville. We're in an unincorporated area. So when they decide on resources, we have no voice. <clears throat> and the only, there is the, the pastor of the Baptist Church of every, all things is stepped up with meals every night and uh, a charging station. I'm trying to get him to be the microgrid hub for us and get a Starlink station there. I'm, I'm, I'm really planning for infrastructure that works when things don't work. People are trying to bring back infrastructure. I think we need to do things like, this will happen again. What will happen when the power goes out? Microgrid hubs are really good. They're inverters, they're solar, they're, they're you know, they, they, they can be a, a hub of, uh, electricity lights and everything else and charging and then uh and then you, you starlink is the only thing that is reliable uh anywhere <clears throat> i can i can send that uh, in fact I, i'll send that link to, to now that i'm online i will send this GoFundMe. oh good we're almost at 
I'll see where we are. When I, when I refresh this, let me go to here. Where is chat? Chat's, uh, chat is here. So, you know, it, it, there are uh, also too many well-meaning people bringing in trucks. And I because I'm really public, I'm saying, look, contact our county commissioner. She's the only one that, that represents the, the worst hit area, which is us. It's one and up. Uh, and there's a great Washington Post story on how bad it is here. And, you know, my, the bridge I go over three times a, a day uh, is it, broken forever. And, and it's been on the national news everywhere I've been uh, up in Johnson City. It's, it's a great picture of total destruction. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, the churches are filling in when the public sector doesn't, you know, I've been texting with a, a good uh, state legislature and she finally, she got... Black Mountain, which lacks the political cloud of the other three towns, she got them a water distribution center. But, you know, churches are everywhere coming in, but I'm trying to get people to connect with Terry Wells, who will take them to folks who know how to reach folks, rather than a truck by the side of the road and people have to find it. So it's, you know, I, I, one thing that's interesting is that one degree more of heat makes the water 7% more able to hold moisture and then the other thing that is relevant is that uh, storms used to lose 75% of their power when they reach land. Now they only lose 50% of their power. Wow. We, and we, we've got a ham radio person in our little network. We've got crank up radios. Uh, the Tesla has a, a radio and you know, it's been, I've been using the battery since Thursday and just went to charge. But it's it's I think we have to plan for infrastructure not working. This is a part of managed retreat that John Warner and I have been uh, looking at from coastal areas. And now we have to think about, you know, managed retreat because the power won't will will break often and we have to plan for that. Uh, you know, you have to know where your creek is to be able to flush. And then, uh, you know, we have I got a power generator, but I think long term I have to look at a solar generator. We have a good well. And I haven't looked into that. We just needed one to get a refrigerator working because there are stores where you can buy food now. But the, you know the the road that's the best road east is Highway 40, and uh, it's closed until September of next year through the mountains. Wow. Uh, and so there are, uh, you know, uh, I-26 Southville this is the first road uh, open. We found a way up I-26 North with a, a friend who knew where the back roads were that Google Maps wouldn't really show. And so, you know, people, are, there's lots of uh, mutual aid happening, but, you know, there, there are nonprofits that are trying to, and the, the coordination and the way FEMA's listening to nonprofits and the way Department of Transportation is listening to nonprofits, we're really near Bee Tree Creek and, and the Bee Tree Dam. And uh, yesterday they uh, took an ATV uh, and there's, then they still had to go uh, hike a mile and a half to the pumping station, the water treatment station. And uh, that, but that enabled them to take pictures to get the Department of Transportation in to figure out the road. And then suddenly like, you know, um, Corps of Engineers is there to help, um, you know, uh, Get the road. Yeah, there's lots of uh, online resources for uh, people to, to do help. You know, if you could get online, it would be more valuable. And you have to drive a, a 10 miles to, to 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 access things. And I think you know we're we're here for the long term. Um, we're in this little um, you know it has been it's, not, it's a fair sized Airbnb that we'll be will be moved into because our house is no longer. It was a fine house, and we hope it can become a rustic ret retreat or something. Uh, and then FEMA will look at the, you know, the the. If you look at my Instagram, I, I spend a lot of time on the shores of the the riparian area of the Swannanoa River, and that's completely transformed. And if you look across, there there are cars in it now, and there are trailers from somewhere. There we have a white car that's on our farm that no one knows whose it is. Uh, wow. Came from somewhere. We have eleven sheep. We've seen one of them in a the distance. We have a we haven't seen our pig. We think our pig may be. Uh, we don't know where our pig is. You know, there, there are, are, you know, there's still a few hundred people that are out there uh, and, and people are being really innovative. You know, it, it's like uh, with uh, COVID mutual aid came alive. 
Uh, but people are realizing that you know, I think, you know, we need to build the infrastructure that works for the next time this happens. And I think these micro hubs are key. Uh, you know, they're, they're solar inverters and you know, they're, they're, they're lights and charging uh, when you don't have it. And I think Starlink is, is, uh, works when nothing else works. And so we've had some folks were there with that. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I've been super active on that, uh, um, raising funds, you know, I think we're, let's see where we are. I haven't been able to be online. Uh, 13 we were at, on me. Yeah, we're at 13,600, the Rebuilding Lives and Connections. Uh, so if you want to help us for the next time, you, you can send water and, you know, uh, diapers. Uh, but if you want to help us for the next time, help us build out a network of microgrid hubs. And it's led by a really great woman I worked with on uh, broadband access here. Broadband is really hard here because of the, the rock, uh, you know, so... You can uh, dig fiber at twenty thousand dollars, you know, in the Louisiana Delta, and you can dig fiber at uh, sixty thousand here uh, because of the rock. And so, our we are incredibly biodiverse because of the hollows that allow us to do a lot more speciation. Like there is twelve kinds of a snail garter that there's only two kinds in Alabama because they had an inland sea and they didn't have the Appalachian stopping the uh, the glaciers, so that means that there's only one route in to lots of places, and when it gets there, it it's more flooded and the roads are are hurt worse. And so, you know, access to all those folks up in the hollers that make us the most biodiverse. That we are the greatest source of of uh, uh, biomedicinals uh, in in this country and maybe more than the Yucatan. There's, uh, you know, those folks fight about it. Wow. Um, and but that also means that we're more uh, susceptible when uh, there might be two more degrees of water uh, or, or temperature that it allows to be made 14 percent more water that and so it goes up further. That's crazy. So I think you know. Uh, it's, you know, and, and working on this GoFundMe has helped me not think about what I've lost. You know, I'm, uh, folks are in my office now throwing away things on the bottom shelf because we, we had three feet of water in the house and we've scraped it out. My office is the last one and I brought books. And so, you know, there's, I will have much more time because, you know, I have to drive to the internet. We're supposed to have power tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure. We're next to a substation, and uh, but some of the substation generators were moved off their base by the water. The, the, it's it's more devastation than you know. I've done hurricane coverage when I was on the Missis in, in Mississippi as a reporter. This is far, and and that was like down on the coast. This is uh, 200 miles, 300 miles up upstream, and it's worse. And we will have more bad storms uh be, and the and the storms will carry more water and more heat that will make it carry further so this is you know figuring out what works when the power doesn't work when the infrastructure doesn't work is if any group wants to look at this uh things similar to microgrid hubs uh i'd love to to in, any ogm group wants to do that i I'm, you know, I, 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 I know where to drive 10 miles to get online. <laughs> so that's what I do. So there's more, it's, it's, it's harder and worse helping people who want to help not be get in the way is really hard because they, they come with a big heart and they don't know who to talk to and they don't know where the people of the shut-ins are. And so, you know, talk to the folks who are there about the people they can't reach. Um, so you know, this is a place people come for the aging medicine, which used to be great before HCA uh, gutted our hospital. Uh, and, you know, people moved wow. here for the hospital, but HCA, uh, you know, our attorney general is trying to, to block that purchase finally or go back on it. Uh, the hospital, like last, the start of this year, they had eight neurosurgeons or, or neurologists. Now they have one because they treat people so badly. The hospitalists, uh, 
they were told to only work part half days and then wait at home if they could be called on and they couldn't leave and go anywhere. So all the hospitalists left. So it's a, it's a real profit center for HCA. Uh, and we're trying to, but it's, you know, we're, uh, so more old sick people move here and there's less for old sick people who move here than there was three or four years ago. So it's a really interesting, uh, if people want to, I really think we need to work on infrastructure for when the, the, the when the when the existing infrastructure won't come back for a month or more. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that goes. Um, damn, Kevin, damn, that's amazing. It, it is amazing. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to be, uh, there's a new climate uh, guy with a master's at Warren Wilson, and I'm, I'm going to propose to him that we we work on, you know, I wanted to say, is it, re, is it regeneration? No, it's just resilience, being ready for these shocks and finding the infrastructure that works when these shocks, Dave Witzel, this might be an area you might find interesting. Uh, we're hoping to meet up next week. I was about to start uh, a, um, paying interns at Warren Wilson to do nature-based uh, uh, startups from, it's a work college with 10,000 acres of uh, forest and food forest. <clears throat> and uh, they, you know, and you work in, in cattle or, or uh, you know, uh, weaving or crafts or the biomedicinals uh, 15 hours and you get a reduction in your uh, tuition. We're looking to do philanthropic investing in them. We're about to hire two interns, one to figure that out and one to figure out a currency that would value the things that that are, are non-cash that are in that economy. And, uh, you know, we were going to meet up, uh, you know, we, we met up on Tuesday and agreed on it. And we were going to meet up this week. And now, you know, the, the college is at least two weeks away. So I think we're we're positioned to do well without infrastructure here if we can figure out that we need to build things for the new reality where, where the, 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 the things you rely on won't come back. What can you do? Um, and I think a, a currency will fit. I'm working with, if you know, guys know Michael Linton, he's some of these calls, but also yeah. some other folks, uh, uh, Elaine, uh, sure, just two, two other currency experts to figure that part out. And, um, yeah, all that stuff we were also going to do. I just I'm going to finish in a minute. I, you know, I discovered that uh, the first massacre uh, of the Cherokee uh, was launched from our land. We bought it from a family that had owned this land for 285 years. So I'm the the first. I'm actually the second family to own this land because the Cherokee didn't own land. They thought you can't own land. What what the hell does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> but you know, then they would send in surveyors and deeds, and then. Uh, soldiers to defend private property rights that hadn't existed and shoot people. Uh, and, you know, a Trail of Tears started from there. But uh, so we were going to, uh, I'm working with a Cherokee two-spirit guy to do a, a, the first memorial to that massacre that's not really widely known. Uh, and uh, it's also a place that is the only undefiled access to a village that it, they've had for 5,000 years. They did archaeology over at the college and the village across the river you know 30 yards and they you know they, when they've dug up their graves they think it's defiled so we the Cherokee will be working with us to tend the river cane and they use their river cane can do these double weave baskets and can hold water and sell for two thousand dollars so I've got a, two assets that the Cherokee who don't like working with uh, white folks will be really involved in you have to give them what's called free and unfettered access, which means they don't have to, here's where you can park and you don't have to talk to any white people. <clears throat> but we were going to do a memorial because one final thing on this, uh, this was, uh, the massacre was done by uh, uh, Scots who came here, uh, who were subject to the Highland clearances. And I, BJ and I went to a, a restored commons village on the west coast of uh, Scotland. There were a thousand of those villages where there was no cash. And they would have like the village bowl and then you would have the two acres of good land and you would give it up every year. But then people started working for the clearances who would come in and do you know, what they did here, which is uh, send a surveyor, make it a deed and, and evict people uh, and, um, and then send troops around and defending private property. But they learned surveying. So they learned to think like commodities about land rather than sharing land. And so we, even in, in Scotland, 
when some of those folks were making some money from surveying and, and, the, and the, the, uh, the colonization of Western Scotland, uh, they would no longer give up the good acre. And so all the thousand acre, uh, the thousand commons villages in Western Scotland went away because the cash economy doesn't work with a commons village where there's, you give up the land in turn rather than I have a, a fence around the land uh, and because I'm also making other money. And so thinking like a, the land is a commodity we're also relates to uh, the rights of nature where we're in relationship with this place. <clears throat> and so, you know, the Cherokee word for river is the old man and the old man just destroyed our ability to sell this land that we've discovered its tragic history in and that they will be with us to memorialize that tragedy. And so we don't know what that means, but, you know, in terms of liquid assets, we can't make money from it. We can make money by having people come there, uh, but it, 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 it no longer becomes a liquid asset. You know, it, we, we cannot commoditize this land where the massacre started. So that's, that's my story so far. Um... Thank you for joining us. Thank you for telling us all of that. Um, I'm afraid I've got to close the call down. Uh, sorry, my, my apologies to Rick and Mark who've had their hands up, but I we need to actually close this down. Um, but I will take this piece of the call, if you're up for it, and uh, post it to YouTube for you uh, in case yeah. you'd like to share it with anybody. <clears throat> That would be great. Thank you. If you can just do that piece of it, uh, you know, because people don't realize, and I, I think you know, fine, send us bottled water and diapers, you know, and feminine hygiene stuff, but help us build the infrastructure that works when the power doesn't work. Sounds great. Um, I, I will do that. And um, it's hard to imagine everything that you all have gone through and are still have ahead. Dave, I'd love to talk to you about what a, a, a couple sessions maybe in your Slack space would be about. Uh, are in this space uh just you know, telling the story i think would be huge right i don't think people really have a you know a visceral understanding of what it's like to be there we don't either it. it's like you know how do you feel people asking it's like you know i got too much shit to do you know uh mm -hmm. you know what about wellness you know i'm sorry we uh we just got a generator yesterday. We can we can put food in that won't, you know, we, we brought six rotisserie chickens back from Johnson City and I have the group meet with them. And so anyway, yeah, I'd love to tell the story, but, I, you know, what else is equivalent to a microgrid um, hub in a community center? You know, what else will be infrastructure that works when you can't rely on public sector infrastructure is that grid. kevin yeah, yeah. um d web um camp is having a uh thing today uh at 10 um basically these people um have community um radio mesh networks um that oh. are resilient and um uh i put a link to um, the d web camp meetup it, that if you can email it to me uh, and text it to me 415-515-0426 415-515-0426 uh, i gotta go back and help clean out shit now I, I i said look i need to go just like tell the folks on the you know the jerryness call <clears throat> and then uh then I'm, I'm back to hauling shit uh you know the rest of the day Kevin, thank you for doing that yeah, thank you, yeah. guys. I, you know, All right, gonna, well, yeah, let me let me know it, when you're, you know, gotten enough stability to try to do something the next step in. You know, cool. yeah, I will, Dave. Thank you. All right, thank you. All all. Right. Hang Thanks in there. all. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jay.